Food seems so abundant in America, but in Wyoming with the long winters, it's not so easy to produce the many foods that we desire. These are Yukon Golds, which are a popular and a, a great potato. I've always been fascinated by the hardy souls pulling food from the ground or herding it off the plains, especially these small growers who sell their products on a local scale. This is an English style cucumber. You can pretty much eat the whole thing. You don't have to peel. Living in perhaps the most food secure country in the world, the abundance is often overwhelming. A colorful variety of food, blemish free, uniform, and often bland. Are we missing something? Turns out, even in Wyoming's short growing season, farmers and chefs are forging a local food economy. I caught up with Curtis Hatterley in Star Valley. I wanted to learn what kept a farmer like him going. I have such diverse interests that it's difficult for me to narrow down even today. <laughs> That's why I have so much going on in this farm is I want to do it all. <laughs> Curtis was born to the farm, but it took a lot of exploring before he could see it as his true calling. Then I went into pre-med and I actually took the MCAT. So then I went back into agriculture um, and really loved uh, learning about agriculture, but even at that point probably didn't see myself coming back to the farm. And so um, I actually uh, became a stockbroker. <laughs> Curtis had good reason to leave the farm. Star Valley has never been an easy place to be a farmer. It takes what some would consider drastic measures. This year, we had, we had below frost temperatures till the third week of June. We've got 60 days, basically, in there uh, of a growing season, which really is extremely limiting. But that's why we have all of these structures that extend the growing season and the row cover, because we do have things like the winter squash that's outside that's just under row cover. It's not under a hoop house. It makes you wonder, what was it like for the first farmers to settle here? like Curtis's Swiss ancestors. Uh, when you think of Switzerland, you think of the Alps. These people didn't live in the Alps. They, they lived more uh, on the plains, I guess you could say, or at least in the rolling hills, and the climate uh, it would be milder. And so they were in for a, a climatic shock when they got here. <laughs> Long, hard, cold winters. <laughs> Star Valley has a storied past. Once a traditional hunting ground for the Indians, German, Swiss, Dane, and Swede settlers of Mormon faith were sent to the valley by Brigham Young to make it productive. Off the beaten path, it was a refuge for Mormons escaping ongoing persecution and Indians driven off of the plains. Brigham Young told the settlers, feed the Indians, don't shoot them. And historian Ron Anderson remembers his grandmother gave them cheese, probably a strange food for them but it's what she had. The Valley's cheese production grew until the 1980s. At one time, Star Valley cheeses were prized all the way out to the East Coast. Over the years, it was known for cheddars, then Swiss, and finally mozzarella, an unaged cheese quick to get to market. It was said to be so fresh, the one end was still stuck to the cow. But eventually, the challenges of climate, a short growing season, and conglomeration of dairy production brought Star Valley's dairy legacy to an end. Only a few family operations remain. The valley's changed dramatically, um, probably because of a number of factors. Our proximity to Jackson Hole has caused our real estate prices to go, I would say, or at least a few years ago, to have gone through the roof. And so that caused kind of, in my opinion, kind of a dilemma because, okay, I'm a dairy farmer. I haven't made any money for 40 years and now I can sell and become a millionaire overnight. Yeah, <laughs> such choices. Should I, should I not? <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. So like many of the growers you'll find in farmer's markets, Curtis returned not for money, but for the way of life. Being a farmer is a multifaceted learning experience to say the least, especially in a climate like this where uh, if you can make it through the winter without the water freezing or something freezing on an animal, <laughs> you know, then you're doing well. And working a second job to support the farm isn't anything new. My dad worked, he had a second job driving a school bus. My mom worked at the local cheese factory where the milk went to make uh, uh, 
nationally fa famous uh, Star Valley Swiss cheese. So uh, farming was not a money maker, but it was a great way of life. Today, Karen and Curtis still rely on side jobs, <laughs> but they keep them on the farm, like with their farm store and herbal kitchen. This is a, a mixture of the dried herbs that I made for an herb tea. And we have oat flowers, and there's nettle, and some burdock root, which we also grow here. And if you've seen them at the Jackson Hole Farmer's Market, you know that this has been a huge success as well. Yeah, we sold out of fresh side, we sold out of bacon, we sold out of uh, all our chicken today, our chicken breasts and our whole chickens. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, the cooler's just about empty. <laughs> Thank you. All right, have a good one, guys. When it came to the point of, okay, so what, what are the options with this farm and what can we do with it? I didn't want to be a dairy farmer. I mean, I don't think that would have been very economically viable, again, just because of the size of the place. He pointed out that though the 100-acre farm was large enough to grow barley and a variety of grains for their 24 dairy cow, most of the profits were spent on hay getting the cattle through the winter. So we started growing some flowers and some vegetables. So just it was a progression. It was an evolution of, of ideas and trials. And then the herbs, that uh, came along as well. We bought Wind River Herbs from the previous owner. If you want a calming anti-stress or a cellulite be gone. And then suddenly had the opportunity to start growing more herbs on the farm. Some of Curtis's diverse interests in medicine and chemistry came into play. The dairy barn was converted to what is now the farm store and herbal kitchen. Uh -huh. okay. And Karen takes care of the many right. details Thank of their herbal line, Thanks like so the soaps much. they make for hotels. Some hotels, we put their own label on it, you know, like we'll make a little label that says, says their business. And the oils and ointments. We make an oil out of black walnut holes that are fresh, and it's, it's good for funguses. And this has led to some surprising new crops for the farm. Stinging nettles, uh, if, if anybody that's been in a stinging nettle patch would consider that a weed and a noxious weed and something to avoid while well, we now cultivate a stinging nettles. <laughs> really a strange thing to have once considered something a weed that you just want to eradicate and then you're cultivating it at some other point in your life. It's strange to think that, well, how did we get to the point where it turned into a weed? You know, why, where did we lose that connection? Because nettles, for example, is a very nutritious, very uh, great plant. Another thing that they cultivate at Hatterley Farms is a relationship with their customers. I feel like we actually have a relationship with all of our customers. I mean, there are people that come in that we've never seen before, but we we engage them. We don't just try to sell them something. And I, I think there's value in that from a from a human perspective, the statistics are something like 99% of Americans have never even met a farmer, let alone been on a farm. That's how removed people are from farms. And so having access to our farm where people can see the animals, wander around, uh, is an education even if I don't say anything, you know, just they can get an education just walking around themselves. So knowing where your food comes from, going out and seeing the animal that's going to be the beef that you are, are going to be eating this winter, now that might be a little little much for some people, but, but just knowing that the animal was raised here and what it's being fed and how it's being treated and the fact that it can be an animal and behave like it wants to behave, like grazing and, and, and things like that, the chickens walking, watching the chickens walk around and be a chicken. This is the perfect place to learn the intricacies of nature. As a farmer, you're almost the conductor. Uh, nature's doing the work, you know. We just have to learn the principles that nature wants to work on. And it's not pesticides and herbicides, for the most part. Uh, although I, I don't, I don't uh, discredit anyone for using pesticides or herbicides. I'm not saying, I'm not saying there's no room for those. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, a natural cycle does not have that naturally and so um, I think most things nature has a solution for and so if we are smart enough to learn what that natural cycle or balance would be then we again we could be the conductor and just help facilitate that but that's a that's that's a challenge to say the least you know what might as well get them 
get a chance to sell them. And finding like minds when you're rethinking how to make a living is helpful. These peppers are actually doing really well for almost... Like I say, we may want to hoop them. We are definitely isolated as far as other people that are doing this, although I have a couple of other friends in here in the valley, in Star Valley, that are doing diverse organic agriculture. Uh, a great resource has been these organic conferences that are held in various places around the country. Uh, the biggest one is the Moses Conference in La Crosse, Wisconsin. So NOFA New York and NOFA New Jersey. Ohio has one. Hmm. Missouri has a, a small farm conference they have every year and they share information. And I can tell that this man is excited about fungi. <laughs> they share this information readily. It's quite, a, quite truly amazing to me. This is one big experiment, and it's a perpetual experiment. This was an experiment. We're always trying to figure out what we can grow, and um, we have chickens, and we struggle with a protein source, or at least one we can grow locally. I got some pea seed after talking with somebody that said we could probably grow peas here. So this is for the chickens uh, as a protein source. So, so that's an experiment that kind of worked. We have our successes. Uh, this year we did really well with our flowers uh, and, and our customers uh, appreciated those flowers. They, they spoke with their pocketbooks and they, they bought a lot of flowers from us this year. So that was really rewarding, especially in this climate, to be able to grow quantities of beautiful flowers. That, that was an accomplishment. Um, now we'll see if we can repeat that <laughs> next year uh, because one year of success doesn't guarantee the next necessarily. One of Curtis's more inspired projects is working with sous chef Eric Sakai at the Teton Village Four Seasons Resort. Yeah, initially I was introducing him to all kinds of things that he had never heard of just because they were local, peculiar things that were growing and, mm -hmm. and he was willing to try almost everything. He just wanted to try it and see. I mean, we have a mustard that's just, again, is just a prevalent weed uh, and we were actually cutting off the individual mustard flowers and they were using those as garnishes. Uh, Sweet Sicily is a, it's a native, but the seeds uh, are very licorice-y. He took those and they were going to use those in some fashion. But we've been clipping off those individual scented geranium blossoms and they've been using those for garnishes on desserts. Um, you know, because they taste like mint or like citrus or different things and it's just been <laughs> fascinating watching him take these very unique products and use them. Under the direction of head chef Michael Goralski, Very good. The Four Seasons brings original creations featuring foods and artisans yeah. unique to the region. A hotel of our size, we have so much volume that comes through that we can help support the local farmer with him giving us a great ingredient that's different than anywhere that someone else might have. This is our regional charcuterie platter we serve at the restaurant. We have an espresso cheddar that's made in Utah, smoked Colorado blue cheese, oh. Idaho Swiss, baby Swiss cheese, and then a, uh, a goat cheese that's made in Idaho too, and then Utah smoked walnut. The focus point in the last year and a half since I've been here is trying to get my sous chefs and myself to get out at the farmer's market and try to build relationships with the bakeries that are local, the farmers that are local, the cheese makers that are local, that they can supply us with a product on a continuous basis and it doesn't have to fill up the whole menu, but it needs to be enough that we can showcase them and then we can help them grow just like they help us introduce the local product to our guests. Like the artisans that the menu features, Chef Michael is an unconventional approach to cultivating talent and originality in his staff. I look for the best talent that's open-minded and has experience, and if they don't have worldly experience, they're open-minded enough and they understand the philosophy of, that we are gonna brainstorm together. And when you have somebody that's been worldly involved, like an Eric has, who's been in San Francisco, worked with some great chefs, been to Hawaii, worked with different ingredients, I think that's the biggest key when you're growing up as a sous chef or a cook, mm -hmm. is to experience as much as you can, and then I can bring it to the plate. It was sous chef Eric Sakai that found Curtis's farm by word of mouth in Star Valley. 
you're in an area that's very difficult like to grow I always knew like the challenge from from the farmers perspective and how much work went into it but coming here and working with Curtis talking with other farmers as well you develop this respect for them they're literally fighting an uphill battle and you know it's it's mother nature against them but you know they really find ways to make it happen and to do it right it's really this this self-contained euphoria he's doing animals you know he's doing livestock he's doing vegetables he's doing herbs and flowers you know it, it's great it's great to see and the benefits for eric going to the farm to pick up produce are often surprising a couple weeks ago we had gone down and right next to his house he had this plant with these little pods growing on them and you know he asked me have, have you ever seen this and I said no he explained it to me and you know I, I popped it in my mouth and the flavor was was so familiar in that it was this kind of anise like fennel like mm -hmm. flavor but very intense but all in this tiny little pod that was probably an inch and a half or two long uh -huh. and you know it's so that's kind of how I guess it happens mm -hmm. a lot of times is you know I'll go down there see what he has you know talk to him walk through the fields and um, you know kind of get my ideas through the tasting and his knowledge <laughs> Eric's worldly culinary experience has given him the tools to craft original meals. Sometimes I think cooking can, can be a very selfish profession because, you, because I, I guess as a chef, um, you, you cook something and from your perspective, you cook it because you feel that that's a great dish, you know? And, and after that, you serve it to that customer because you cooked it, you created it, you think it's a great dish. And when you're in a city environment, you have um, a clientele who's very responsive to that. You know, they they want to come in, and they want to they want to walk through the doors, and they want to hand themselves over and just say, you know, take me on a ride. People come here, and they come here, you know, looking for um, for the beef. They come here looking for the buffalo for the game. And it's nice for me to be able to incorporate, you know, vegetables into these dishes. These people come expecting to have their meat. If they can leave talking about a vegetable aspect of, of, of the dish or a component, you know, I, I think that's, you know, pretty rewarding. Having come from one of America's great vegetable producing regions, Eric has experienced the best of both worlds. When you take a vegetable from its raw to its cooked state, there's, there's, there's so many different temperatures and textures, and every one of those temperatures and textures gives a different result. Like, we char the onions like completely black to the point where most people would think that it, it's a burn. And like, we, we just make sure to cut them thick. And so you get that balance of like flavors, like bitter and sweet, mm -hmm. and it's not so one-dimensional. That's a great part about vegetables because when you're talking about like meat or fish, whether you sear it on the outside or you poach it, the, the main texture of the fish will generally always be the same regardless of your cooking. It might be slightly moister in one or um, you know, maybe a little drier in another, but a fish is going to flake the way it's going to flake. But a vegetable can be manipulated. For me, it's not about just eating red meat or you know, just eating chicken or just eating fish or just eating vegetables. You know, I think from a, a complete sustainable aspect, it's about balancing everything because anything obviously in excess is not good. When you walk through the kitchen at the Four Seasons, it's striking how industrious the work is. This is hard work, aimed at consistency on a four-star level. Yet, there's room to explore and experiment to create something new for the pleasure of the customer. What you know of, of the kitchen now and the way it's set up 
and the way it's organized, a lot of that was based on fundamentals of, of a French you know, brigade system. It was, it was the chef's vision and, and that was that. And that was the vision that you, know, you carried out as the cook without any question. But I think slowly now, you, you know, times are changing. And you, know, you always have that aspect of the kitchen, that rigorous you know, military-like style. But on the other hand, you see a lot more like fostering of you know, the talent. So what I try to do, like I said, is I encourage them to think outside the box. You know, I think you never really know until you start trying to push things a little bit. But at the same time, you know, balancing that, um, mo those modern techniques and flavors with the classics. So this, is, this should be fair, a fairly interesting dish and predominantly everything from this dish came from the farm. So I would, I would go on a limb to say like 85 to 90% is from Curtis. You know, save the basics like the olive oils and, 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 and fats and things like that. But the way this dish came about was every time I go onto the farm, I drive down the driveway and there's, there's chickens running around everywhere and there's animals running around everywhere. And they had been cleaning out some of the beds. And so there's a, there, there's a big pile of like greens and um, vegetables and, and the chickens were just going crazy. I thought, well, you know, like it would be interesting to serve these components with Curtis's chickens which are raised so nicely. But I thought if they're eating it, it would be interesting to serve these components with the chicken. First is chicken, which we, we did in a couple preparations. And then um, they were eating carrots. So we had some carrots from the last pickup. And we picked up a bunch of beautiful lettuce and they were eating all those greens. And I guess normally whenever you go there, they're foraging through the grass and all these the grains and this and that, so we incorporated some um, oatmeal and, and everything into the dish. All right, so we'll start first with the truffle sauce, one of the sauces. In this bowl, we've got the farm chicken eggs, some melted butter, and our truffle stock. Essentially, what we're making is a classic sauce just reinvented and we're making a sabayon in a different way and this is some truffle oil and finally is a little bit of lemon juice and basically what we're going to do is whisk this up we'll transfer this into our insulated canister and we charge it with the nitrous oxide, which is gonna help aerate it later on. This would just go into our water bath, that's over here. It'll cook these eggs very gently, um, prevent them from curdling, but it'll give it um, a lot of stability and air later on. And the breast, we seasoned like very simply with salt and pepper, some thyme and olive oil. And what we did was we, we put these into a vacuum seal bag and we cook them again um, in our water bath that's maintained at a very low temperature. And the legs, we did similar. We took out the bones and took out the skin. And all the extra meat we made into a mousse. And we stuffed the inside of the chicken leg, wrapped it up in plastic wrap to get a nice cylinder, and sealed it and cooked it in the same fashion as the breast. And then finish it on the stove some lettuce to quick saute. Some of the carrots that we've cooked are also that we're gonna finish real quickly on the stove. The sauce is a concentrated like chicken sauce. And so we took all the bones and vegetables and we roasted them and that we simmered for like six hours. And a second round with more vegetables, some wine, and then we cooked them all the way down probably for another four or five hours. The number one thing that drew me to Curtis, you know, other than the fact that when I look at his operation, I know that there's no frills to it. You know, there's, there's nothing commercial about it. 
and that's the, one of the first things that drew me in. But the thing I think that really sealed it was we were going through like a, a slower period, you know, here at the restaurant and the hotel. And so I explained, you know, that we were probably going to be backing off a little bit on our quantities. I said, maybe you can sell them to some of the local, you know, grocery stores that, that look for these like organic products. He said, I would rather not do that because he said, if I sell to that supermarket, the person that's going to buy my vegetables has no idea about my vegetables. I mean, that's quite a place to be coming from, especially for, from a farmer's perspective where it's such a hard life. It's such a hard profession to actually make a living off of, to, to have those kind of values and you know, hold to them, I think is, you don't, you don't find that. Wyoming has many imaginative food producers expanding the possibilities of local food in Wyoming. Join us for more episodes as we meet these innovators reinventing the local food economy in Wyoming.